to the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Corpodian. Welcome back to Unleash Success. If you haven't subscribed to our newsletter yet, just go to unleashsuccess.com Enter your email so you can get all the tools and strategies sent directly to you each and every week. Welcome back to Unleash Success. This is your host, Corey Corpodian. Today, we're going to break down some secrets and how to pitch anything with the author of the book by the same name, Orrin Claff. He has raised over a billion dollars in capital throughout his career, helping people create ideas into reality. And today, he's going to help us break down those secrets to success. Orrin, thanks for coming on the show. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, being, I'd say I appreciate being here, but I'm in my own office. So I guess I appreciate you being here. Well, I appreciate inviting us into this awesome office, by the way, which it feels like a kid in a candy store. You got these awesome dirt bikes behind us and a lot of really cool cars. And so I wanted to get started with, you know, before we get into the book and pitch anything and how to really kind of create a presentation that kicks ass, how exactly did you get started with this idea and this method. Yeah, sure. So I think I got started with this in the same way that everybody who figures any formula or system or method out is deep frustration, sadness, pain, agony, uh, sleepless nights, and uncomfortableness and going, that's enough. <laughs> right? Uh, right. And, and then I think the other piece that and so pain, a lot of people have pain and frustration and, and all these kind of things. They don't solve things. I think the thing that tips people over is they work next to a natural. Okay. Somebody who does it seemingly so easy with no training just seems to figure, have the whole world figured out, uh, in the palm of his hand. And in the exact same thing, you've got these incredible frustrations and difficulties and you go, why has he got it so easy with no training, no special skills or, or mentorship? And it's so hard for me. There's a, a, a glitch in the matrix. I'm going to fix it. I love that. I, it's something actually I started doing when I was a kid watching basketball players. I wanted to be in, in the NBA. Yeah. Well, you uh, can't teach height. Yeah. No, unfortunately <laughs> you can't, but I was, I was learning about crossovers and I remember the idea of visualizing what they were doing and they looked like they were natural. Sure. They had hundreds and thousands of hours, but the idea of modeling someone else's yeah. success. And that sounds like what you did pretty well. Yeah. So reverse engineering. So right. I had a partner and he just seemed to stride onto a phone call. Everybody'd be laughing. He'd make the perfect joke. Um, he'd talk about the project or the deal, you know, from 360 degrees and people loved it. And, uh, you know, just call him John. John, when can we talk to you again? And he's like, I'll talk to Orrin. And then wah, wah, here comes the buzzkill. And within three minutes, everybody's like, oh, I got to go. Well, that sounds interesting. So some information. And so um, I started reverse engineering. What was he doing that worked? And, and, um, over time I started to understand. And then I supplemented that with, I looked at everything from hypnosis to psychology to, um, uh, you know, the sales books and everything I get my hands on to try and understand exactly what he was doing and why it worked. And eventually I came on a formula and it's now, I mean, I've taught it to, you know, over a million people. And they wow. are out using it. We get emails every single day. I did exactly what you said and it worked exactly what you said. So, so I think what makes me feel good is I figured out something that doesn't just work for me. So you see most people have a method that works for them. LeBron James, right? You like, you can't do what LeBron James does because you're five foot 10 or whatever. I can't do it because I'm, um, you know, not even that. And, and so, you know, all the athletes and the Brad Pitt, like you can't be Brad Pitt because you're not Brad Pitt. Where the magic comes from is when you have a method that anybody can follow the steps, add a blueprint, and duplicate to success. And that's what I'm most proud of is coming up with a method for pitching anything that, uh, you know, we have CEOs who have very difficult to understand accents. They're from India or they're from Australia, you know, deepest Australia. You can barely understand them. It works. You have people from China, uh, you know, um, with very strong accents and they're introverts. You don't have to be a backslapping, uh, but, you know, uh, frat boy, you know, with tons of connections and out drinking and, you know, talking about women and cars and all that kind of stuff for people to like you. Those are just symptoms of some other things they're doing. So that's, 
you know, the, what happens is we see this surface behavior that people are doing and you think, I gotta be like that in order to get the results they're getting. But you strip that all away and you see what's left and you, you, you pull the curtain back. What are the actual mechanics of the human mind when it comes to decision making? I like that you said you weren't a natural at this. Oh God, <laughs> please don't go down that route. Like weren't a natural is an understatement of the world. Like I could ruin anything. Any, any deal that was already on its way to being done, put me on it and I'll ruin it. That's how not a natural I was. Uh, it, it just I, goes to show that, I mean, I, I read your book and, uh, you know, some of the pitches in there were absolutely incredible, yeah. raising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. in a single pitch. Um, and just as for people out there who are listening to this right now and they're going, man, I have no idea how to sell anything. I'm horrible at it. Yeah. And now you're a testament to what's possible. So, so I think that's right. Uh, and I'll tell you a story here quickly. <laughs> Something happened to me, uh, that just shows you the change from where I started to where I am now. Uh, we had a deal and I knew it flat cold. I could pitch it, um, not in the way I do now, but my partner taught me the pitch. I could copy it. I knew it. I had it written down. And it wasn't that hard because all I had to do was give this pitch to 150 analysts on the phone. So I wasn't up on stage. I wasn't in a conference room or one of these high right. stress situations. Uh, and I had jokes and I had, uh, you know, some funny parts and a preamble, you know, almost like a TED talk. And then, uh, you know, it was all sort of orchestrated in my mind. You were highly I'd given prepared. It, highly prepared. Thank you. And I'd given it many times to my girlfriend, to the, my colleagues, and I was ready. Put me on the phone, right? And you hear all this rustling and people chattering because there's 150 people. And then the host goes, I'm now going to mute everybody and turn the mic over to Oren. So they mute it and I start and I drop, you know, my intro joke. Tumbleweeds. That's I'm tough. used to feedback. Right. Ha. So now I'm in a panic, right? Because I don't know if the joke worked and my timing's off and my brain starts to get in a panic mode and then I forget the next part. I'm rumbling with my notes and my notes aren't in order because I know it and, and the whole thing falls and it was terrible. You forgot that they muted the audience so they couldn't I didn't, even laugh. I, you really, hear it. I didn't have the experience. I didn't, you know, so we, the, what I learned there is we are validation seeking machines. And ultimately, the ability to tell your story, give your pitch, tell the details of your business, your idea, your product, your service, your company, yourself, whatever it is, without needing validation from someone else is a large part of the secret. If you see comedians, so I used to live in West Hollywood and uh, sometimes, you know, I'd have a friend who was a comedian or an actor or whatever and I'd walk in on these comedians, you know, give, to a dead empty uh, uh, audience and they're giving this incredible, you know, comedic performance, 18, 20 minutes long, as if the room was full and they're not needing the feedback and the laughter and the attention. So it's the validation seeking behavior that holds us back because ultimately, if we need validation from the audience to go forward enthusiastically into the next part of the story of the pitch or whatever it is, then the audience can hold us back at any point at any time by doing almost nothing. So imagine what negative feedback does, ruins the whole thing. Validation seeking behavior or neediness kills any and every deal. And if you rely on the audience, you're giving them control over the success of your pitch or your sell. Absolutely. I, it's better to, uh, um, you know, die on your feet than live on your knees, you know, as they <laughs> say in France. So if I, uh, um, if I screw it up or I mess it up or it's not a good deal, I want to at least be in control of my own destiny. When I turn control over to someone else, I automatically, uh, um, risk everything. So neediness can and does kill any deal. So, so that's where yeah. I started, gotcha. right? And, and that put me on this journey of saying, okay, what do I have to do to not ha give control to the buyer of my own destiny, but still be able to tell a story and engage with them and have them, you know, emotionally, uh, interested and engaged and intrigued and, and, uh, you know, and following along, but not needing them to. And that's the gray area. And once you solve a formula in there, you can pitch anything. 
You said getting them to emotionally follow you along. Yeah. Well, when people are pitching stuff, they're looking at the numbers. They're they're talking about yeah. what, what discount are you going to get me? Does this make sense for my business? What, what do you mean emotionally? So, so I think as I looked at the presentations we gave in our business and other people gave, and and um, YouTube started coming online, and and people were putting pitches online. What I realized is they all started with some fundamental mistakes, which which were about the numbers and the market and the product features. Right. And so if you look at presentation, they all start out the same. We're the number one mousetrap in our industry. Microsoft uses us. Facebook uses us. The janitors at GE uses us. Here's a uh, article that ranks the top, you know, here's a uh, uh, Forrester ranked the top five mousetraps. We've been number one three years in a row. Right. Our mousetrap has the quickest kill rate. Right. It releases a, uh, a nice scent when the snap comes down and kills the mouse. <laughs> right. And. And it sends a text message to the nearest Roomba, and the Roomba comes out, scoops it up, the trap releases automatically, the mouse is gone, didn't even know you killed it. Amazing. So what do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in? Right? So, so that's, you know, whether you sell software or whether you sell logistics or whether you sell uh, consulting or insurance or whatever, they get into the, um, we're number one, this is the evidence, here's our social proofs, here, here's our features, the, the objective uh, evidence that we're good very quickly, right? But there's no stakes. There's the, in, ter- in what, what makes people pay attention, makes people interested is stakes in terms of human lives. So stakes in terms of human stakes. lives. So like so, literally so life and death. <laughs> life and death. So, so when you pitch, uh, semiconductor manufacturing, when you pitch, uh, uh, routers, that are faster when you pitch computer chips or SaaS software for accounting or accounting services or insurance or consulting services, got to find some way to frame it in terms of humans and real estate in terms of, you know, one thing my partner taught me is buildings are not worth anything except for the people that go in and out of them. That's what makes them valid. That's what makes a billion building valuable. So everything is in terms of humans and human stakes. We have to pay attention when things are in terms of humans winning and losing, because we, our brain automatically wants to know how to win and lose things. Even it, it's so, so much so you see a you know uh, a fight in space, right? And the the white stormtroopers and the the, uh, the you know the good guys with lightsabers and la- you are never going to be in space uh, shooting laser weapons against stormtroopers in all likelihood. Right? I feel like right. I'm in it right now a little bit with all the pictures around us and everything. Yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. cool. It's pretty so, sweet. So. See, but, <laughs> But you have to pay attention to that space fight right. because your brain says at some point in time, I could be in conflict or in danger in a human situation. And rather than solving it on the spot, which is almost always deadly, conflict with humans historically, you know, 70,000, 50,000, 80,000 years ago when our minds really developed into the patterns, the th- thought patterns we have now, every contact with everything else was dangerous, especially humans. So any kind of conflict between two people uh, is was life-threatening. So we learned that when we see other people in conflict, to pay instant attention to it. Hmm. Because our mind wants to, doesn't want, knows that uh, conflict is so dangerous. We want to learn from other people's stories, other people's situations, other people's conflict, how they got out of it alive. So we don't have to solve it on the spot in a dangerous situation situation. And you know that, right? So if I yell right now, Tom and Susan are outside throwing, um, uh, swing it at each other. This podcast shuts down. Everybody runs outside to see what's going on. I got to see what's happening in this conflict. So a pitch should start with conflict, hmm. not niceness. So this is how people start. If I see, if I see a hundred pitches in the next 30 days, they'll all start like this. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate the time today. We're excited about meeting you guys. We prepared this presentation for the last couple of weeks. We really hope you decide to go with us. And if you do, we'll bend over backwards. You see at our company, the customer is always first. You can contact me on the weekend. I've got my pager. I'll give you my grandma's number. Sometimes over at the lake house, I'll tell you how to reach us there. Or you could fax me and we'll be very responsive. Um, uh, and, and we're really excited about working with you. Right. So this does a million things wrong. Right. Right. It lowers the stakes. Yeah. It lets the buyer know I have you. You're an option. You're not going anywhere. 
It's supplicating and it's needy, right? And that's how we start. Lower our status, let the buyer know, eh, this is an option. Once I know your price and your features, I put you in a box and then go look for other ones that are cheaper or better or free. So, so this is the problem. When you start with conflict, and, no, and, and also people don't have to pay attention very much to that because they know at any time, you know, you're available and you'll send more information and they can, and that's immediately you trigger people to get on their laptop or, you know, respond to texts on their phone or think about their vacation or whatever is going on with them. When you begin with high stakes and conflict, people pay attention immediately and they know there's something to win here and there's something to lose. So, uh, I mean, pick any subject, you know, what do you, what do you like, care about? Yeah, pick, I, I, pick well, anything. I mean, I, I watched a lot of Shark Tank, and uh, they just debuted, you know, season 10 and everything, yeah. and this guy's talking about door lock. Yeah. I'm thinking, man, how many pitches have I seen on Shark Tank, and how many people, you know, want to be on Shark Tank pitching these guys? Yeah. And maybe they have 45 minutes to an hour, but, you know, they come in, they're like, hey, how's it going? How do they create intrigue? So this guy so, had a door yeah. lock. He yeah. Literally, the, the concept Great. was a, and nobody invested even though the guy from Ring, who sold to Amazon for a billion dollars recently, uh, was one of the sharks now. Yeah. So they brought him on. It was really cool. Um, so door lock, because we've got all these packages coming, and yeah. the idea was to scan the package. It would unlock this bin, and you'd put it in there. Great idea. Sure. Seems like a great idea, right. but, you know. One, How did the pitch start? Um, it Well, yeah, he started with, like, here's the problem. He was presenting what it is. Everybody kind of understood the problem. I I really didn't see conflict in the pitch as far as, like, life and death, so to speak. Because, honestly, uh, from a consumer perspective, I look at my packages pretty much always get there. I have had one time where it didn't show up so and, like, they were, like, might have been stolen. And then on the flip side, from the delivery perspective, it's just another thing that they've got to do. So I never heard about this before in my life. But let me just think about it for a moment. Today, in the urban environments we live in, and the populations are so large, and there are a very small number of people that you know, that you trust, that you believe in, and that you want to spend time with in your personal space and around your house. Who are those people? Well, certainly, it's your children and your spouse, and then it's your brother and your sister and your mom. And then it's your cousins, and then it's your neighbors, and then it's your best friend. But outside of that, everybody else, stay away from my house unless you're invited. Except for in the package economy, who comes to your house two, three, four, five, eight times a day? Amazon, DHL, the post guy, the post guy two times, the guy who delivers the water, the guy, uh, um, the gardeners. Right. So there may be 13, 15, 19 people that come to your urban, suburban house during the day, you don't know and you don't want to know. I like it. Definitely raised the stakes a lot more than that guy did in the pitch. I'll tell you that. And he walked out there without a deal, actually. Yeah. Well, I want, yeah. So, so, I mean, Shark Tank is a whole thing. Like, <laughs> so those guys invest in things because, you know, they have to in the show. If you walk into Mark Cuban's family office, investment yeah. firm, and you go, hey, I've got some great fucking barbecue sauce, Right. <laughs> The, the 17 guys in there who make money by making investments and moving capital around and billions of dollars go, are you fucking kidding me? Get out of here with that shitty barbecue sauce. But on Shark Tank, Mark Cuban has to invest. So it's not a natural environment for investing. I got Those aren't real investments. But anyway, yeah. So so that's how, I never heard of that before. Yeah. But, but you know, in some ways, watch some TED Talks. They come out and, and they all have stakes, right? Uh, they had a guy on there just talking about the ridiculousness of conspiracy theories, right? Okay. And and he turned it into what happens at 4 a.m. in the morning, right? And he found, a, you know, 100 examples of gangsters and mafia and army attacks and spies. And, and you know, his, his thesis is only the most nefarious things at a time when I want to be most tranquil, asleep, and dreaming about the most uh, uh, wonderful things in my life. 4 a.m., lots of notorious things happen. And then he goes into the, that type of conflict. You know, if they want to talk about, you know, motivation, uh, they'll start off like, what happens when your heart stops? Mm-hmm. Three years ago, I found out, and for two minutes, I was no longer here on earth. And what happens during that time would amaze you. And now you got to pay attention because what happens if my heart stops? And where do I go? And is there a God? And is there a hell? And which direction am I heading in? Or are we all just worm food? Right? It tri- so if you watch those ten- TED Talks, they're, they're schemed 
to start in that way in human stakes. So you could give me any, I mean, you give me a lock, right? I mean, you can yeah. give me anything, insurance. A you lock's know, not very exciting. <laughs> uh, I mean, a table, a, a floor, a carpet, anything could be put, put in, um, in it framed up as important to uh, human lives. And so, so that's, so, so now you've got people paying attention, right? And what do you do with that attention? Yeah. And so for me, once you have somebody's attention, it's framed up in human lives. So one is, um, you know, what's interesting to me is it is a incredibly well-respected and regarded executive capability to talk for a few minutes, but not about my company or my product, right? Because everybody comes in, they just want to, they don't know what else to say. So they start with the facts because the facts are safe. Like we have the number one lock, our lock turns off automatically. We won the TechCrunch award in 2017 and we won the, uh, the EPI award and, um, 2000, late 2018, and we, um, you know, just hired 15 employees and we got $3 million of venture capital from Kleiner Perkins. And, um, we're now distributing, those are all facts, yeah. right? And, and people go to those because they're safe, they're believable, and they, uh, boister or, or support our status because we're not lying and we're saying interesting things, right? Right. But now the, now the product features are out. The only thing we can do now is move into benefits because features, yeah. benefits follow naturally. Keep your family more safe, reduce theft, um, save money, and um, you know have more control and security in your life. The benefits, right? Okay, I got features and benefits. We're now two minutes, three minutes into this pitch. Now I want to know price. How much is it? Well, it's forty nine ninety five a month. Okay, pitch is over. Four minutes. But you had an hour meeting. Yeah, what what is the ideal length for your pitch? It sounds like, I mean, that that four minutes right there, one, is rather boring, and it's like you could have sent me an email for yeah. that. So how do we flip the script and set it up? You started by introducing conflict right away in a, a life and death stake, and where you were like, wham bam, do you how do you how do you entertain that and like interweave that so that it makes it a dynamic pitch? Winter is coming. Winter is coming. If uh, watch Game of Thrones, I'm, I'm on season six. So I'm on yeah. season six. Okay, <laughs> I'm on. I'm on season twenty three. I'm actually writing the thirteen seasons. That well, don't good because the author stopped own. writing yes, it. Right. Yeah. Uh, so every once in a while, I get uh, you know some uh, uh, somebody with a high level of religiousity, and they haven't watched Game of Thrones, but everybody else knows what it is, and the whole series everything about it is based on three words winter is coming look at any plot twist any character anything in it is is they they can immediately tie it back to it's going to get very 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 fucking cold right and if you don't have food and you don't have shelter and you don't have friends and you don't have alliances and you don't have magic and you don't have um uh, you know things that can be eaten and you don't have something to burn to have warmth you're gonna die Winter is coming. So, so that's the entire, you know, billion dollar, multi billion dollar franchise is based on those three words. Winter is coming. And you need to base your saying, your pitch on that. So after the sense of consulting services, we sell personal training, you know, it's context in terms, I mean, personal training, right? Today, there's so many toxins in the air. Plastic has no regulation on it. Now they're introducing CBDs into everything you can eat, touch, or smell. Right. And nobody knows what that stuff has in it. And almost everything is synthetic. If you don't do something to increase the, your heart rate, your blood flow and the quality of your health, these toxins are going to shorten your life. Right. And, and, and so you think, okay, well, I don't know what I was going to do with those two years between 98 and a hundred. Right. I wasn't really planning to right. do a lot with those years. So who cares about those two years? But today it's not about those two years. It's about 30 or 40% of your life is at stake. You have to increase your exercise and the quality of food going into your body. That's it. So, yeah. stakes, okay? I was just thinking that you you, go, you went from, not only is it life and death, but also there's a time constraint where literally we've got to feel that right now. So, so absolutely. Um, stakes, time constraint, and specificity. That's, okay. right? So that's that's got to be in the opening. But the next thing is winter is coming, right? There is, I mean, yesterday we had the news. They think that if we don't stop that uh, degree and a half in climate change by 2030, 
Boom. Every pitch that anybody listening to this should have should in some way center around that, unless you're talking to Republicans. Don't <laughs> no, Climate but, change is but, not real. <laughs> um, we just had a, uh, a, you know, a new Supreme Court, like change. So what you have to do is frame yourself as an expert as in change. The most valuable person in any business and in any business relationship is the person who knows what's going to happen next. If you're a salesperson and you know what revenues are going to be in the third quarter of that business, everybody wants, the CFO wants to be your friend, the CEO wants to be your friend, the board of director. If you know what that's the, what is going to happen in the future and you're accurate, you're the most valuable person in the whole business. So to be valuable to a customer or an investor or a buyer, you say, look, we have just had a dramatic change in our industry. And, and in real estate, it's tax and regulation. In almost every industry, it's tariffs. And we just got a new Supreme Court uh, composition. Uh, we've had this global warming report. We have, um, you know, a change in the, in the global relationships, for lack of a better way yeah, to put it. We have a new NAFTA agreement. Tons of change, right? Let's just pick NAFTA, right? NAFTA because you have to. As you know, there is a new Canadian, Mexico, American agreement. The tariffs are complicated. The regulations are hard to navigate. And the taxes can be uh, extremely painful if you don't know what you're doing. It is 50, 500,000 lines of new law. You get that wrong can affect your profitability for years. We are experts in the North American Free Trade Agreement, and we understand exactly what has to be done over the next two years to make money. And people don't understand that are going to go from leaders in the industry to followers. And the followers who understand it well and work with us are going to become leaders. We know this better than anyone else. And if you don't get this right, it can be extremely painful. So you use the change as a line of demarcation you put that change beyond the knowledge, the skills, and the capability of the buyer, the investor, of the person you're talking to, and you give them confidence that you understand how to um, make decisions in the way the world is now working. I, I believe that basically our our minds and, and what we're driven by, our desires are driven by two main forces of pain and pleasure. Going back to just evolutionarily speaking, you know, pain is death and pleasure is life. Right? Sure. So, um, and you're using this idea of like, we're going to solve a problem, but also too, which I believe pain drives you more uh, strongly than anything else. Um, you're saying like, if you don't do this right now, you're going to lose millions of profit over the next 10 years um, in the NAFTA trade agreement example. So if you overtly say that, right, it feels controlling. Yeah. But if you put it forth as an idea, then somebody is interested and wants to be around you. Ultimately, if you um, give some insight, so it's not saying if you, the word if should be stricken from your vocabulary. Um, give insight to what is happening that stretches beyond the knowledge and the experience of the person you're pitching to, and they'll want to be around you and work with you. If you can go to a car dealer and impress them with some insight about what's going to happen in the car industry, if you can tell something, if you can tell somebody something insightful uh, and interesting and valuable about their own industry, they will love you and want to listen attentively because uh, uh, they'll, they'll view you as a high status person and a peer. So ultimately, that's the job of the pitch, right? One is to not communicate, I'm a salesperson with some features and a price that you own, but to say, I'm a peer and I know the business we're in, but I know a specific part of it that is very valuable to you. And, and I can, um, the, the things I know, um, are important to you. And if we continue our relationship, you can take advantage of my knowledge and my products. That's what you're sub communicating in the pitch. So, so again, we start with raising the stakes. Then we go with a big idea, right? The, the, there's a change in our industry. Here's my thoughts on it. You provide insight. So that insight will then uh, help people uh, respect you as a peer, especially if you take their knowledge further, build you up as an expert, raise your status, and make them want to hear everything else that you have to say. Those are the two things that everybody screws up 
because they just dive into, this is the facts about our business, these are the features, uh, these are the benefits, this is the price. So I think that's the key to starting. I like that a lot. And building this interest, showing them the big change, establishing yourself as an expert. I find that a lot of people, though, especially when they're pitching and they don't really, maybe they've never done it before or maybe they've done it a few times and they failed, which is why they're still pitching yeah. to somebody to get them to either buy their product or invest in their company. Um, they don't have necessarily the confidence that they need to feel like they're the expert necessarily. Yeah. How do you go over that? I think that's good. So step one, go to improv classes. I I get these real estate guys who are introverted. I get tech guys. I get... Uh, um, Go to improv classes. First of all, no one's going to do it, but for the one out of 100 does it, he's going to race to the front. That gives you the ability to be grounded. And So in improv, anything comes at you and you put it in a framework and push it back. Have right? you done improv? Yeah, absolutely. All right, what's yeah. the number one rule of improv? Uh, number one rule of improv. If they, somebody asked you a question. Yes, right. Yes, exactly. You always say yes. Yeah. It's oh, You always like, agree with them, you know, because exactly. if you stop... And I did improv classes when I was in New York, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a huge amount of fun. And I never thought about that as like how it would help me pitch something. Here's why people don't do improv. Because in the first three classes, they're going to make you touch another person. And in business, we don't like to touch other people. And they're, you know, you're going to put your hand on their knee, right? And I really don't want to touch another guy's knee during the <laughs> middle of the day when I'm not drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if you could survive the first three classes, which are, um, you know, maybe not meant for you as an accountant or a software engineer or a consultant or, you know, what, whatever it is you do. Um, if you can survive those th- three classes and you start to get into the situations that improv puts you in and you get put in these many different situations. And when it does it, it helps you hunt for a framework. So somebody says, you know, you're a butterfly looking for a landing spot, um, you know, you're a talking butterfly looking for a landing spot on a runway when there's also Boeing jets coming and the tower is calling you over a radio, right? Go. So that's an impossible quagmire unless you have a framework to put in. So it makes you mentally hunt for frameworks to put situations in and get control. So improv gives you confidence. But I think the other thing is, mem- uh, one thing that I've discovered is time passes very differently for the audience and the presenter. As a presenter, it takes you a while to get warmed up. So in the beginning, when the people most want you to be warm and confident and give valuable information, you're going, well, hey, it's good to be here today. I really like the office. Um, uh, oh, some beautiful audience members. Uh, you know, I got stuck in the limousine. The door wouldn't open. That's why I was a few minutes. Like you're just trying to get your lips moving and your mind lubricated and the audience is going uh i'm not experiencing confidence or structure or a framework or insight you know or professionalism or anything but you're not you're just trying to get warm then pretty soon once they're tired you're warmed up and you start going my god the sound of my voice is mellifluous the wor- is anybody writing these words down that i'm saying this is incredible so, so, so you start to get comfortable with the things you know you're saying and the sound of your own you voice. Look really, and really comfortable get, right there. R- I appreciate r- that. Amped up. <laughs> <laughs> so Vi- violin music. So, so, so you're presenting so, and you're sitting there and you're like, all right, you're you're say you come out with conflict. How do you keep your energy not not just your energy high, but their energy high, so that they're not sitting on their phones while you're trying to okay. give your pitch? Right. So there's a. M- there's a million questions in there. Let's just take this sequentially. Memorize the first three to 500 words. Okay. That's going to get you moving, get your lips going, get your brain engaged and give them something to chew on that isn't, I'm sorry, I'm late. I couldn't find a parking spot. Really, motherfucker? You came here to ask for $2 million? You couldn't get here on time or find a parking spot? What else is good about you? Right. Okay. I can't, I say that guy, I can't tell you how many presentations, I'm sorry I'm late, couldn't find a parking spot. Get the fuck out of here. So, Not important enough to you to come on time, right? That's what, you're, that's what they're saying almost. Or, yeah, or, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, and, and if you are late and things happen, then you just say, hey guys, we're going to speed things up. Because you guys can't figure out how to, in this city, how to give enough parking spots for the business people who kindly come visit you. Now, 
That was a good flip. A yeah. good uh, a reframe to be able to shift it so it's not your fault necessarily. Well, but there's no pe- there's no need to make yourself look bad in front of people who are already skeptical. Okay? Your job is to raise your status, not lower it. Yeah. Okay? So I don't want to control people. I don't want to manipulate people. I just want to share with them my understanding of what's changing in the industry and how good we are at creating value in the new world order. That's all I want to do, right? No one will listen to me until they believe, this is the problem, until they believe you're a peer or a person of high status, I'm not going to listen to you. So you got to memorize those first three to 500 words because you know they're good. They're, you know, if you think about a comedian, right? I love going and, and you've been in improv and you've seen comedy. Like, like the job of a comedian is to make you feel like he was just walking down the street and somebody goes, hey, you know what, Chris Rock, can't show up tonight. Would you mind filling in? Oh, sure. Why not? He just stepped on stage, came up with a couple ideas and started rambling. That's what a great comedian is, right? Makes you feel like he's never said this thing ever before. He's just coming up with it on the spot, right? Yeah. That's So the randomness is what makes it the, the feeling of, um, uh, you know, it's not packaged and it's off the cuff, um, but it's still good is what raises your status. So the first three to 500 words, think about how fast do you think you, how many words do you think you speak a minute? Oh God. Uh, sometimes I say I talk fast, but 50? I don't know. No, you speak 120, 130 words a minute. Oh wow. Okay. If I really get ahead of steam, like I'm doing right now, this might be 165, 170 words. I mean, I can move up the gust of 200, but then you sound like an auctioneer. Anyway, 220, 230,000 230, soul. You know, probably an auctioneer is probably 250, 280 wow. words a minute. Speaking, you know, on a podcast, a podcast, you're probably 120, 125 with gusts of wind. You're up to 160, 165 words a minute. Three minutes at an average speaking pace is, uh, is, you know, 360, less than 500 words. 360, 400 words. Memorize a goddamn 300 words a minute. Give you confidence. Let something you are practiced in. So, so ultimately, the great pitch is not something that you will wing. It's a performance that you know and are confident in, right? And that affects the levers of the human mind. You don't have to customize it for the specific audience that you're getting. That brings up a really great question about um, your audience because I feel like some of the methods, and even in your book and just what we're talking about right now, would probably work pretty well with me and my personality. Um, But sometimes people might be a little bit more reserved. Sometimes people are more focused like... You know, some people are like, I don't really care who you are, what you do, but if you save me 10 cents on every single product, you're, you're in, right? How do you gauge your audience? And you say you don't really have to shift it too much. Like, what are you going to do then when somebody's a little bit different? How do you blanket the audience to be able to still keep them engaged? So, so my feeling, this is one of the fundamental curses of selling today is young salespeople trying to gauge their audience and change their presentation in a moment's notice. What I've learned from speaking all over the world, you never come up with a joke on the morning of the speech in the shower because it sounds amazing. Oh my God, this is, I'm going to kill people with it. <laughs> anyway, and then, um, then I've hung up the phone on him and told him, kick rocks. <clears throat> Chairs shuffling, a thousand people. You never change your format, who you are, your presentation to in service of someone else. Okay. Okay. Now look, we're having a lot of fun here and we're swearing and we're joking around. Right. Uh, but when I go in and ask for a hundred million dollars, yeah, there's a lot of this preserved and packaged, but it's appropriate for what I think reflects who we are and what we're capable of and who we really are. If you don't want to sell somebody yourself, you know, in a package, it doesn't really exist. Right. So I'm a version of this when I go to give a pitch, but you know, we, it, it is also in the language of finance and the language of buyers. But, but going back. So when you gauge your audience, you say, Oh, these guys are stuck up or these guys, um, don't seem friendly or these guys seem very conservative. Right. So I'm going to act conservative, but you don't necessarily know how to act conservative. And then you're inauthentic. Mm-hmm. This is the problem. When you gauge the audience, 
try and change a picture you already have and who you are to meet who you have just uh, assumed that they are, right? You present yourself as someone who's inauthentic. The great pitch finds the anchoring center of who you are, what you're capable of, what you really know, your integrity, your authenticity, your capability, your desire to help, and your willingness to follow through even when you may have gauged something wrong and aren't making money, right? That's the job is to communicate all that, whatever it is. If it's not good enough for the buyers, then it's not good enough, okay? It's them, not you. If you have a good value proposition, if you compete um, in the market uh, uh, squarely with something, you communicate it clearly, you give them a big idea, you put it in context, you explain how things are changing in the industry, what um, what value you guys know how to provide post-change, what specifically the problem is that you know how to solve, your familiarity with the problem, what your solution is and how it works, what else can you do? You've given the great pitch that that you worked on. Um, it, you worked on clear communication. You laid it all out. You presented a value proposition. You made it fun. You made it interesting. You were on time. You did it with integrity. Um, you have uh, uh, examples of how familiar you are with the problem. What else can you give? If that's not good enough for them, then that's fine, right? Uh, now, now, if it's not good enough for everybody and it fails every single time, there's something wrong with the value proposition. Yeah, let's so, get into so, yeah. that too. It's just, what are some of the most common mistakes you see people do when they're trying to pitch somebody um, that results in them failing? I mean, not failing once because so you know, sometimes- So we hit on did. three of them. Right. Right? Um, not to talk over you, sorry. Uh, but we hit on three of them. Um, and, and number one is starting off about me instead of starting off with a, a notion of human lives are changing in our business. Things are at stake and a decision will be made here today, mm-hmm. right? Then, so that's one. Uh, the second is not having a big idea based on change. If you don't know how your industry or the buyer's industry, the investors, if you know what's changing, what value are you, right? You could still think my space is, uh, you know, something you log into, uh, you know, right. you could be one of those guys who has to print out your emails and then, you know, write the answer and give it to your site. Like if, if, if you don't, uh, you know, Google X, uh, Google X, um, Google, uh, um, Pro Google plus. plus, yeah, Google, Done. Google plus announced it's shutting down yeah. yesterday. Right. So if you think Google plus is still a social network that is, you know, high, so you need to draw that line for people and explain how things are, are changing. So, so one is the mistake of, starting with um, um, statements about yourself and how good you are. That's mistake number one. Mistake number two is not clearly identifying a change in the industry that's important and that we all have to pay attention to. I would say mistake number three that you, you know I'll bring to the surface here is most people start talking about their solution before the problem. Nobody really... Huh cares that much about the solution until they believe that you really understand the problem. I, the, I'm actually surprised that that's a, an, an interesting thing, but maybe people are so excited about their product that they just jump out ahead of the gate without adequately it, describing the problem. It's not that they're excited about their product. It's that they are nervous, want credibility, and features or facts give them the ability to talk in a way that's truthful honest, incredible. So here's a, an interesting thing. As you're going over these different mistakes people make, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what if you do give a great pitch? You knock it out of the park, and at the end, the guy goes, that was awesome. I have to think about it. Sure. Happens all the time in sales. Happens all the time in pitches. You know what? We're going to take a few days to think about this. What do you do to try and close them right then and there? Because if somebody leaves your office or leaves the meeting and they're not 100% like, hey, we're doing this, doubt, I feel like doubt comes in. They just go to their other friend. They maybe listen to another pitch. How do you try and get them to come to a, a decision in that meeting so in that moment? The fourth biggest mistake or the fifth or the ninth, well, actually the 27th biggest mistake that we've covered here today is getting to the point where you say, so that's my pitch. What do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in? 
never, because then you're, what you're just saying is, I'm done. You take control of the meeting. Tell me what we're going to do next. Okay. So it, you, I'm not saying that you're going to do that. But everybody does it. Oh. <laughs> they give their presentation and then they go, basically, they either flip into a trial close or they say, so what do you think? That was our presentation. Do you have any questions? Ah, uh, yes. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Right. That's the end of the meeting. Right. And then there, maybe they have a few questions. Don't even ask. Answer. Don't yeah. even ask if you have any questions. Just say, email me your questions. I'm leaving and run out the door. It's the same thing. <laughs> so is, what do you do? How do you, how do you end with some oomph? The way I would do it, and it you know, depends on the situation. You know, are you selling a TV? Are you selling you know, a, a $5 million investment, which is not going to happen there? Let's do today. high stakes yeah. for a moment because yeah. a lot of people are entrepreneurs. Maybe they've got an idea. They mean, yeah. you know, let's say $250,000 to sure. get started with Who their business. Who are they business. talking to? Yeah. Um, they're talking to venture capital people. Sure. So venture capital is not going to invest $250,000, sure, yeah. right? But, but let's say you're just talking to a friend, family friend. Family friend, friend family friend. Hey, um, I got this dating app for grandmas, right? The world needs this. I got this dating app, uh, and I'm talking to a family friend, and you go through the pitch, right? And you get to the end, and you say, so we believe that um, with $250,000, the application can be launched, and uh, in Q2 of the following year, we can be cresting through 15,000 users, um, although we won't have monetized them at that point. We'll be in position to raise a full round of, of seed capital at 1.5 million and we can recapitalize your $250,000 that you've put in and we'll be on a path to successive financings and growth of the deal, right? At that point, is then you would say, um, so that's what we have. Talk to quite a few people about it, even financing s- sources who say, yes, if you hit those milestones, we're in the wings with one and a half to $2 million for sure. So we're quite confident in what we have. We put in our own capital and we are at this point looking for the right person. As you know, an early stage investor, you know, um, whether it's friends or family or just somebody you met can be the best thing for a company or the worst. Now I know you personally from family, you know, and friends and barbecue, but I don't know enough about your business life. And so if you handed me $250,000 $250,000 right now in cash. I go, why are you carrying around $250,000 in cash? But if you handed me a check or you said I'm in, I would have to, unfortunately, and as painful as it be, say, I'm not ready to take it. I don't know enough about you yet in terms of, I know you make great barbecue chicken and you'd love to play with the kids and you don't mind if we switch football. And those are all great characteristics. I don't know shit about your business life. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's right. I mean, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about your business life for us to say let's jump. In. I know what we have. I know we have momentum, and I know we've done it right. I'd love to hear some of the things that you've done that make you a good fit, and will let us work together and communicate together and be um, um, and be the right people to do this for the next two or three years. Can you tell me about yourself? And what happens is if you've given a great pitch and you've organized information in their mind in the way that they need an answer to all their questions, they're going to now pitch themselves to you. And that's where you want a meeting to go. Because if somebody won't pitch themselves to you and tell you why they're good, they're probably not a good buyer, probably not a good investor, probably good not a good person to, to work with. So that's the turn that you have to make happen. In my head, I'm almost thinking, is that a tactic? Because you really want their money. But at the same time, if they're not a good business partner for you, You'll be in a world of hurt later on. So you, that's very insightful, Corey. And I think you're touching on the thing that's most important. A lot of people will do that as a tactic, but the question needs to be authentic, Mm -hmm. right? Even if you're selling cars, right? Um, So we just bought a a Toyota 4Runner, right? And, and, um, you know, the salesperson said, I just want, you know, it's hours of paperwork for me to write this thing up, right? Because they don't negotiate on price anymore. The price, they publish it and you see it online and you get it on eBay. They don't, I still negotiate the price. So, Come on, man. So, <laughs> Give me $500 off. <laughs> so my, my wife's uh, Range Rover broke down and uh, she was away and I'm like, I need to replace it, right? So from this office, I looked up dealerships, right? I'm like, oh, there's a Porsche dealership four blocks that way. So I walk to it and I go, I'll take that car, right? And they go, 
oh, well, we'll set up a test drive. I'm like, no, 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 no test drive, right? They're like, oh, we'll get you the features and I'll bring out Tony and I'll explain it to you and drive around. I'm like, I don't want to drive it. I don't want to know features. Sell me that car, right? Right. And they're like, well, we'll put you in finance and you can talk to the manager. You can figure out a price. No, I want the price that's on the window. I will pay that. Like, there's no way to buy a car today <laughs> if you just want to buy it. Um, Sounds crazy, right? So, so... They should pay attention um, when you're when you've actually sold somebody. Just stop talking and give them and well, sell it to them. Well, they have a process because it's not really like a heavy negotiation process. Like you know, they take off a thousand dollars. That's it. No more. No less. Gotcha. But but the the job is to say, listen, something that uh, um uh, I got to write this thing up, right? This these forerunners in this color, we literally, you know, we sell everyone we have. So I'm not trying to sell it to you, but I now have to go in, write the whole thing up. Market is sold. Do a couple hours of paperwork. Get all your information. Please, just tell me this is the one you want. I saw you looking at three. You know, you also told me you were looking. You know, you you already got the Porsche. You know, you um you you like that car. Just tell me that this is really going to happen. So I'm not blowing three hours on a car that I can sell anyway. So she's not trying to sell us. It's just a true concern, right? right. And we're like, no, 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 of course, listen. So then I go, listen, I have 11 cars. Let me tell you how I bought each one. She's like, oh, God, right? That, no, no joke, right? So it's right, at, it's right at the road. It's even closer than the Porsche dealership. It's two blocks that way, the Toyota. I'm like, come with me, right? Come with me. So, so I'm like, uh, I want to go for a test drive now. We didn't even want to test drive it, right? So I make her jump in the Forerunner, walk her down here, and, and I start walking around all, around all because she's like, oh, my God, like it's Saturday. I just need to sell cars. I'm like, see this car? And I'm proving to her. That when I say I want a car, I actually buy it by showing her the other 11 cars I have sitting around and telling her the buy story on every single one of them. And, uh, and, and so that backfired on her almost by saying, hey, are you a real buyer? I'm like, really? Let me show you what a real buyer looks like. And I kidnapped her for like two hours. Um, and we have a good relationship. And, and you know, of course, we bought the car. But the point is, <laughs> she wasn't trying to sell us. She was just asking an authentic question, whether you sell copier, or consulting, or accounting, or whatever. What's the what's the authentic? What's the authentic question that yeah. if the buyer can't answer, or they don't know, aren't willing to talk about, they're definitely not a good buyer. What about when people say, you know, I just I have a great idea, I don't have any money, and I don't know how to get it. What do you tell people like that? Oh Lord. Um, well, that's that's horrible. Um, I mean, I guess the issue is if you if you're not willing to put your own money, yeah. you know, into an idea. Here's what I would say: ideas are worth nothing. They're literally they're worth nothing. What's worth is the experience and the ability to execute. There's a million ideas. A lot of them are great, but they get killed because they look at the person who has idea at that moment in time and go, that person can't execute on this idea, even though it's great. This is why, you know, you think about like Dropbox, right? That file sharing had been done 75 different times. Um, and and uh, whatever his name was, Junior you know, came up with a twist on it and he executed on it and got it going. And Dropbox, you know, became the dominant file sharing paradigm when there already yeah. was many, many different file sharing schemes. It's it's not the idea, it's the ability to execute. So people come to me today and they go, this is the other thing is they go, uh, hey, I have this idea and I'm looking for $3 million. I'm like, listen, that's not contemporary because at Y Combinator or TechCrunch or these all these incubators, incubators, you know, they throw them in, they give them $50,000 an idea right. and they come up with a business. You want $3 million. So for an investor who can give this company $50,000 and come up with a business, you want... $3 million for the same value proposition doesn't make sense. I can get, you know, dozens of businesses for $3 million from a raw start, yeah. not this one crappy brick stretcher, whatever it is you came up with. So, so that's not a good setup is I have an idea and I need money. What is, what is a good setup is I had an idea. I put my own money in. I didn't come to you when it was an idea. I didn't come to you when we had no idea if there was a market. I didn't come to you when there wasn't a single buyer. That was on me and my family and my friends. We put the money in, right? Now with a quarter million dollars in, we have customers, we have the application, we have product, we have uh, revenue, we have recurring customers. Now it's time to scale. 
and I'm professionalizing the investment. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, and how does the the pitch, obviously friends and family, um, I love what you said about making sure your friend or family is actually a good business person because they're going to be your partner for the long run, especially if they're investing early, they're probably going to have a sizable investment. What's the difference from taking that pitch? What do you do differently when you're pitching for a couple million dollars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think um, fundamentally, the when the dollars go up, uh, I mean, even just the 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 fundamentals are the same because the mechanics of the human desire. People want what they can't have. People chase that which moves away from them, and they only value that which they pay for. Okay, totally. so those mechanics are all the same. I think when the stakes go up to three million dollars, five million dollars. $50 million, there's a higher um, requirement to speak the language of finance or to speak, to speak the, when, when one buyer talks to another buyer, they have a language. So for example, when two Corvette dealers talk to each other and you go, hey, listen, I've got a late model 17 with a 5.1 LS1, and I've got a 18 with the LS2 and the track package, but I really need three red uh, um, 2016s because of the market we're in, right? And you go, okay, I'll give you an LS1, an LS2, two 16s, and um, we'll give it to you at the market window. Done. You know, whatever language they have, you know, they t- so, so if when you come to an investor, with the language of an entrepreneur, it's a problem. Mm. Because they have to convert what you're saying with a decoder into their language. And you, they're, they're less likely to do a deal with you because yes, you're sophisticated about your business, but you're not sophisticated about financial transactions. And so they are going to charge you a higher price. In other words, give you less money or take more of the company because you don't know the language of finance and you're going to have to learn it on their watch. And so, so you got to do that with with your pitch, right? With you, the pitch, right? These are the steps and not these are the crazy steps that I came up with, but these are the steps and maybe we can end here that every other entrepreneur has taken to build a, an idea into a product, a product into a customer group, customer group into a market, a market into a working business. These are the steps we're taking because they work. So it's mapping the things that people always do to build a business into your business. That's what makes investors invest. There's a couple of questions I just want to ask you too before we wrap this all up. Um, and then also just the last actionable steps too of pitching. This has been fantastic so far. Um, I'm curious what success is for you in the pitch. Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know if this correlates at all, but I noticed in your book, uh, in the page to who this is for, you say, for dad, yeah. true north. Yeah. What does that mean to you? So my dad was an uh, academic a college professor, and he always did the right thing. No matter if it cost money, if it was self-sacrifice, if it, uh, and he always took it on himself to do the right thing. So I always felt like, he was, uh, in terms of a compass, like my true north. So I say, what? Because when you're in sales, when you're raising money, when you're in the, in the wild world of entrepreneurialism, you're faced with dilemmas every single day. And so you want to take shortcuts because they're money and they're good things and there's planes and cars and trips and, and celebrity and all these kinds of things. So I feel like um, if you don't have an anchoring true north that never moves, you start to make compromises, and then that compromise becomes your new center. You make another compromise, uh, and it moves. You make another compromise, and your your center of what is integral and what your values are are either constantly moving, or if they're not constantly moving, they shift too easily. So for me having one concrete, never moving, moral north helps me make decisions all the time. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate you sharing that with us yeah, too. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for asking. Um, so yeah. Um, it, and it's 
I think we've been talking about pitching and everything, but yeah. also too about the mindset of what it takes to be successful. We mentioned being authentic as well. Um, but when you say that, you know, uh, in entrepreneurship, like you said, and in sales, it's easier sometimes to skim on the side or to take a shortcut. And it's a lot harder to, to stay centered and to stay true to your values too. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and, and just to be like clear, that. like, so not to be abstract, like for a salesperson, right? Uh, if they have a bonus coming in the, you know, if they can group sales into a single month period and achieve a bonus, you know, they'll move the dates, you know, the order dates. So, hey, I'm going to put this order in next week to make my July is lost, but I can make August, I can make my August numbers and get the bonus, right? So even those little things, because if you'll do that, what else will you do? So it, right. it's easy to to start to head down that road. So anyway, I just want to be concrete about you know how easy it is to um, try and manipulate the system, but then you know you you'll find you manipulate a little bit, but you're only manipulating yourself for sure. Well said. Um, one of the last things we always talk about is just kind of the eighty twenty rule, and the way I use that is eighty percent of our results come from twenty percent of our actions. Yeah, and the key is really just knowing which actions to take. We've talked about tons of actions here. And I'm curious if there's one action you would do, um, one thing you would do kind of before, during, and then after a pitch that would kind of collectively bring us all together as yeah. far as like, what's the biggest things we can do to prepare? What's the biggest thing we should do inside the pitch? And then follow up or what, what do we do afterwards? I think the, the, the 20% is don't talk about yourself, your product, and your company at the beginning. Number two, Talk about the problems and your familiarity with it before you introduce your solution. I won't introduce the features and the benefits of our solution until I'm 70% of the way done the entire presentation. So your familiarity with the problem is where you should spend most of your time. And then the other thing in the 20% is not to end up and say, so what do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in? Do you have any questions? You say, so that's what we have. This is why we're busy. And I'm interested to hear more about you. Great. Yeah, I was going to ask how we end that. And then um, I, this just came up because we've talked about these pitches being almost like four to 15 minutes. What is the average length of time you think a, a proper pitch should be? Meeting lasts 50 minutes, 60 minutes. The pitch where you say, this is what we have. This is what's changing. This is the problem. This is the solution. This is how it works. This is the ROI. This is the value proposition. This is our team. That's 18 minutes. There's nothing you can't pitch. I, I you know, I, I can talk fast. There's nothing that can't be pitched in eight to 12 minutes. I'm assuming you're a little bit slow on the uptake, a little bit inexperienced, should not run past 18 minutes. These TED Talks, I mean, everybody knows the comedy routines are 18 minutes. TED Talks are 18 minutes. Your damn pitch is not 25 minutes when everybody else in the world is anchored to 18 minutes. Yes, I understand Mission Impossible is three hours and 15 minutes, right? They have Tom Cruise and explosions and weapons and submarines. You don't have that. You have 18 minutes to get it done. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, after the pitch is done, do you do anything to solidify, like after the meeting's done, to solidify the deal or to ensure that they don't get cold feet. This is our next podcast. Oh, that wow. A, it's a full-blown yes, thing. that is yeah. a whole thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you just follow up with them? We One thing just like... Following up will work. I mean, ultimately, you have to construct a time frame. Time frame. That's fair. So in many sales industries, they have false time constraints. Yes, because we deal in abstract things, consulting, insurance, SaaS software, any time constraint, like SaaS software, like it's not like, oh, we're running out. <laughs> We can't ship right. you anymore. Yeah. Right? The last, I went to buy a Ford truck uh, one time and they're like, oh, you want a black F-150 XLT? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> right? It's the most commonly sold vehicle right. on earth for the last 50 years. You have one. Don't tell me you can't find one. So, so but anyway, you have so SaaS software. So it's not a false con time constraint, but it's a reasonable time gotcha. constraint. I'll tell you how much time I'm willing to put into this before I got to pop smoke. And go do something else. Yeah. And that, that makes total sense. Yeah. And I've done some deals where it's definitely like, hey, if we're not going to do this deal together, we both need to move on with our yeah. lives. 
Um, and exactly. Yeah. So and, and so what is that time frame? And then you just work work backwards from there. Awesome. Fantastic, man. Uh, Orin, where can everybody find you online? So you can find me online um, in uh, basically one place. You go to pitchanything.com. I'm right there. Awesome. And we didn't even get into the plethora of knowledge uh, of how to do the pitch from start to finish in your book, Pitch Anything. But I will definitely include that in the show notes because I really enjoyed it. Also, I did do the Audible as well, oh, great. Uh, yeah. which was entertaining and, and nice because you actually recorded it yourself. Yeah. Um, I thought that was great. And so our last question is, you've achieved so much success, raised over a billion dollars in capital and have all of these things going on. But for you, what is your next level of success? So it's, uh, I'm a just, I don't know if I haven't, I live by the beach. I got a couple of nice cars. I got a little boy, you know, uh, more. I have another book coming out. Oh, cool. It's uh, on. It, How to pitch everything. It's called, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's called Persuade Anyone. Awesome. Same subject more of the same. Um, so I'd like people to buy that book. Uh, and we just want to grow our business a little bit and, and keep more of the same. You know, when I was 30, the next level is I need $100 million. Then I need $250 million. Then I need a billion dollars. But today, pretty happy. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to just, um, you, you know, we've, we've probably helped a million people. We've definitely sold a million copies of the book. We've helped a million people. I've trained 80,000 people from stage. You know, we'd like to hit 2 million and 3 million and 4 million. Wow. I really appreciate that mission and just kind of inspiring others, helping others as well. And thank you so much for coming on Unleash Success. Yeah, I appreciate it. You had great questions. And yeah, I've done hundreds of these interviews and this is a good one. Awesome, man. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. If you enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that I have is please go subscribe, whether you're on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you leave us a five-star rating or review, that absolutely helps us get our message out there. Each week, I'm going to continue to interview amazing people, and we're going to break down their tools and strategies to help get you real results. Feel free to visit the website, unleashsuccess.com, and subscribe to our newsletter so you can get updates each week. And remember, knowing is not enough. Knowledge alone is not power. Action is. Because action is the only way you're going to get the results you want in life and truly live the life of your dreams. So take some action, subscribe to the podcast today, and get ready to unleash success in you.